Alan Wake 2 is a sequel that is just as good as its predecessor. Alan Wake 1 was an ambitious and impressive title from Remedy Entertainment, and 13 years later they've done it again with Alan Wake 2. Today we're going to be talking about the story of Alan Wake 2 to hopefully piece together what's going on here, while also occasionally stopping to not only theorize about some of its more vague story elements, but also critique those said elements along the way. All will be explained in due time though, but before we begin, I have a few notes to bring up. Thanks to Remedy for getting me an early code so I can have some time to play the game before release, and I also want to give a warning for both spoilers and flashing lights. Ellen Wake 2 has a ton of flashing lights, and while I've done my best to remove them, you should be careful if you're sensitive to that kind of thing. As for the spoilers, we're going to be talking about Alan Wake 2 in its entirety, so make sure to beat the game and come back. If you need a quick refresher on the first release, I made a video similar to this one last week on the first game, which covers the base game, the DLCs, the spin-off American Nightmare, and a brief talk about the Alan Wake DLC in Control. So make sure to watch that video first if you need to. Without further ado though, like the video if you enjoy and subscribe if you're new, check out my other story analysis videos on a variety of games and series if this content interests you, and let's get started. Alan Wake 2 starts with us taking control of someone who just swam out of Cauldron Lake. Obviously, this is the same lake that leads into the Dark Place, but the person who escaped was Agent Nightingale from the first game. The game itself confirms this later, but you could actually spot this beforehand, as one of the first things he says is Hemingway, a reference to his old bit. Last we saw him, he was taken by the Dark Presence, but was briefly seen at the end of the first game being used by the Presence, likely as a tool. While walking, he ends up stumbling upon a few random people out in the woods. Nightingale is then taken and sacrificed by the cult in some kind of ritual. Kinda sucks he died this early as I was hoping to see more of him, but at least he got to make an appearance at all. Regardless, this finally begins the game in earnest, but instead of playing as Alan Wake, we play as FBI agent Saga Anderson, who is partnered with another agent named Alex Casey. Both of these characters are important in their own way, revolving around their names. Saga Anderson, as we'll eventually learn, is related to Tor and Odin Anderson, the Rockstar brothers whose band is the Old Gods of Asgard. And Alex Casey shares the same name as the fictional detective from Alan Wake's Alex Casey book series. The first logical thing to consider is that Alan Wake created him as a way to get him out of the dark place. But as we know, Alan can create something from nothing. What most likely happened is that he found someone named Alex Casey and then made him become a detective. So while Alex Casey the person was always real, Alan may have lined up his life in a way that made him become an FBI agent. What's rather interesting though is that Alex Casey has the same voice actor and face as Max Payne, since that's what he was always designed to be. Meaning, Alex Casey is an early tease of what Max Payne will look like when Remedy eventually remakes the games. The reason they're here is because they were visiting Bright Falls to investigate the missing people who were killed here years ago. But as soon as they arrive, someone else was murdered, which is that scene with Nightingale earlier. Upon arriving, Saga is able to deduce that the murder of Nightingale matches up with the MO of the other victims. This easily proves that the cult is behind the prior killings and that this is a part of a ritual. While trying to find the killer, the duo finds a manuscript page, which is obviously written by Alan, that describes the duo reading the page they just read. To Saga and Casey, this makes no sense, but to us the players, this is very much Alan Wake's work. Without knowing where to proceed after reading the page, they decide to handle things normally and proceed with an autopsy. This takes them to Bright Falls, where they meet with Sheriff Breaker. However, this isn't Sarah Breaker, but her cousin, Tim Breaker. Sarah unfortunately does not make an appearance in this game as she left the sheriff position and become a federal agent instead, with Tim taking her place. It's a shame Quantum Break isn't a part of the Remedy Connected universe on account of them not owning the rights to it anymore, but it's still good to see Sean Ashmore getting roles from them. Although on that note, it does feel like Remedy's trying to connect these games that they've made without using the actual IPs. Tim Breaker is tied to a character I'll talk more about later called Mr. Door, who has a similar name to Mr. Hatch on Quantum Break. And Alex Casey is obviously meant to be the Alan Wake version of Max Payne, as they have the same backstory, voice actor, and face model. I've always wondered if this was Remedy's way of getting all the games in the same connected universe, while also getting around the rights of the games they don't own. Mr. Door especially, since Tim Breaker mentions how he sees Mr. Door in many different dreams, but in different circumstances. So maybe in another of his dreams, it isn't Tim and Mr. Door, but Jack Joyce and Mr. Hatch. It's not a perfect explanation, and I wouldn't consider it a fact either, just an observation as Remedy likes to throw in references to their other games all the time, so it's hard to tell if the reference is just an easter egg or something that should be taken more seriously. Either way, the following scene shows Tim Breaker being thrown into the dark place after touching an old stack of manuscript pages, Nightingale getting up and escaping, to Saga and Casey chasing after him back at the lake. It's around this time where Saga then discovers what's called an overlap. This is another plane of existence similar to the dark place, but it seems to be created as a result of the dark place and our world merging together. Both worlds need to contribute for the overlap to be made, the reality of our world connected with the dark stories or history of a specific location, and a work of art created in the dark place are what's used to make this happen. 
The story is what Alan just wrote, and the real event was Nightingale getting his chest cut open during the ritual, which created an overlap allowing both worlds to merge in that location. This doesn't seem to exist in the real world though, which is why certain steps are necessary to gain access to them, like with this overlap where we have to say a chant and then push Nightingale's heart through a hole in a sign. Inside said overlap is a lush forest that has Saga being hunted by Nightingale. While we're here, we get to learn a bit how Nightingale even managed to get caught up in all this. After Alan entered the dark place back in the first game, the lake itself started to recede. And along with it took people whose hearts were surrounded in darkness, Nightingale among them. While in the dark place, he attempted to find Wake, but was taken by the Cult of the Word. Sort of like our current cult here, but different. They then killed him and pushed him out of the lake to find the Clicker, the item Alan had used to defeat the Dark Presence all those years ago. Clearly he hasn't succeeded, and he isn't going to, as Saga is able to finally put him down. What follows is a short talk between her and Alan, where the two seem to see each other, but can't quite hear all the words they're saying. This talk though seems to shoot Saga back to the shore along with of all people, Alan Wake, who is now finally out of the dark place for the first time in 13 years. Honestly, I thought Alan escaping would have been the finale of this game, not the end of the intro. But it does make sense why this was done so early on once we make it to the actual finale. As an opening, Alan Wake 2, like the first game, starts off really well. Remedy is rather good at making impressive openings that hook the player in, and Alan Wake 2 is no exception. That being said, this praise only comes from a story perspective, as gameplay-wise, Alan Wake 2 takes a long, long time to really get into, mainly due in part to there just not being anything to actually shoot at. I'll elaborate on the combat a bit later when we get to it, but at the time of recording, I was 3 hours into the game and had only killed about 5 enemies. Much of this time was spent exploring the new wide areas the game has added, but still, even as someone who focuses on the stories of games on this channel, gameplay is important first and foremost, and it will take a long time for the player just to get a feel for the mechanics, let alone come to a conclusion on whether or not they actually enjoy it in the first place. Saga then decides to bring Alan back to the Bright Falls Lodge to get an idea as to what's going on, as this is all still new to her. According to their talk, Alan doesn't remember writing the pages, and that these pages are from a book called Return. Return may be familiar to some of you, as that was the same one he wrote in American Nightmare, but while the title is the same, the contents are different. He's written many different versions of Return, hoping that it will return him to the real world, but none have worked out, and American Nightmare was one of those failed attempts. To get a bit more context, we're then given control of Alan so we could see what happened from his perspective. His journey starts with him waking up backstage at a late show called In Between with Mr. Door. The host, of course, is none other than Mr. Door. He, like many elements of this game, were teased back in Remedy's prior game, Control, as one of Dylan's dreams talked about a man named Mr. Door and how he shifted between realities. And here though he just seems to be a late show host, but numerous manuscript pages seem to point to Mr. Door just going along with the charades that he can achieve his real goal here in the Dark Place. According to him though, Alan's new book Initiation is set to release tomorrow, and it's going to be a sequel to Departure. This confirms a long-running theory, which is that Alan is trying to complete the hero's journey. This concept is a writing structure first created by Joseph Campbell, in which he describes how there must be certain steps made in a story that the hero must go on. There are 17 steps in the process, but it can be boiled down to three distinct acts. Departure, Initiation, and Return. Or, more specifically, the plot of Alan Wake 1, the current plot with Alan, and then the plot with Saga. Saga's story in Alan Wake 2 is influenced by the manuscript pages that belong to the book Return, and Initiation is Alan's journey in the dark place before washing up on that shore. This is further reinforced by what is supposed to occur in these acts. Departure usually has the protagonist go from everyday normal life to a bizarre and twisted one thanks to a specific event. Just like Alan went from being a writer to having to fight the Dark Presence. Initiation is meant to be the same protagonist learning his way in the world that he's been thrown into, which is going to mirror Alan's upcoming campaign, and return as the protagonist return to his old world or life with their reward. Sometimes that person will use their skills or weapons to defeat the evil that caused them to leave in the first place, or they might sacrifice themselves to save the ones they love. This is meant to be Saga's campaign, which is not as obvious now, but will start to make more sense as we continue. There are also many steps within these acts, which surprisingly still match up, like how within the departure act the hero must meet with a mentor, which is when Alan meets with Thomas Zane, as well as cross the first threshold, which is when Alan sacrifices himself at the end of the first game, but those are the three basic acts. This is also why Alan failed in American Nightmare, as he skipped the step while trying to escape. He tried to return without going through his initiation. Now that doesn't mean American Nightmare isn't canon, as it most definitely is, it's just one of Alan's many attempts to escape the dark place using return, before realizing that he needed the initiation part to make it work. After the talk show was over, Alan is left to explore the rest of the building, and located in the back is Ati, the janitor from Control. Ati's role in Control has always been a mystery, and Alan Wake 2 isn't going to help us get any answers either. But I believe Ati to be, for a lack of a better word, a supernatural helper. 
Not only does Ati, like a real janitor, have keys to all the worlds as he's been freely traveling between the real world, the oldest house, and now the dark place, but he always seems to show up when the protagonist needs him. When Jesse couldn't get past the ashtray maze, Ati was there to help. And he's also going to be helping Alan quite a few times by pointing him in the right direction, such as now. He's like a physical deus ex machina in a lot of ways. This time around, Ati wants Alan to go downstairs and get the lamp from the shoebox. This lamp is the same one that belonged to the clicker. The clicker was the switch that would turn on this lamp. As such, it has similar magical powers, as Alan is able to capture light into the lamp and then release it into other places, which adds more complexity to the puzzles. Upon going outside, he is greeted by a call from Thomas Zane, who will be seeing much more of shortly. For now, he tells Alan how to find a murder site, as these sites are going to help him escape. Like many things within this game though, this part about the killings is quite confusing and not one I'm fully confident I understand. All of this and by extension the rest of Alan's campaign take place in the dark place, but these ritualistic killings we find are real and not real at the same time. The person we meet when walking down the streets of this fictional New York is Alex Casey, but not the same one from earlier. Casey will die in just a few moments via the dark presence, yet not only does he show up later, but he's still alive in the present day. These killings we're trying to find have also seemed to have happened, as the FBC has a note about the cult called the Cult of the Word who are the ones doing the killings. Furthermore, despite Casey dying, we find echoes of him throughout the Dark Place, one of which mentions the cult by name, and the killing we're about to find, even though this is after, implying that Casey actually lived these events. It's to my understanding that the cult of the word and Casey being the lead investigator on this case actually happened, as I can't imagine the FBC report is lying. The only issue is how much of this is real in regards to the story. This report was found during Saga's campaign, so how much of the book Return is influencing this? Furthermore, this could all be the work of Mr. Scratch. As long story short, Scratch is not only the author of Return, or Saga's campaign, but he's obviously still alive in Allen's. Both cults, the word in Allen's and the tree in Saga's, are different from each other, but they are very similar, as they both refer to themselves as cults, which not even real cults do. But if Scratch is the leader behind the cult of the word, it's clear that this was the inspiration behind the cult of the tree, when he was writing Return. Regardless, this cult as stated before goes by the cult of the word, and the reason they're tied to Alan Wake is because they're reenacting deaths from Alex Casey's book series by killing people in the same way. To them, Alan Wake is their messiah, and the books are their bible. This specific killing happened at a subway station. A bunch of these cultists seem to have killed a bunch of people by trapping them in a subway car and then set it on fire. Walking through this is… horrifying, as their charred and lifeless bodies are accompanied by constant screams of pain. It gives me some flashbacks to Spec Ops The Line, and that's definitely not a game that spawns some pleasant thoughts. Eventually, Alan is able to change the scene to reflect the ritual, allowing him passage into the previously blocked tunnel. Inside the tunnel was the murder site Alan was looking for, Witches of Nightingales. These murder sites are in a sense overlaps, as following each one is a conversation between Alan and Saga, just like we saw from Saga's perspective earlier. These overlaps, on Alan's side at least, allow the Parliament Tower to appear, which is where he and Alice used to stay back in New York. Once Alan makes it to their apartment, he sees that Alice still has the cameras on, which she put up to photograph the monster who keeps appearing in her home every night. She seems to have taken these pictures and used them to make an exhibit, showing the world the horrors of her life. It's also the first time we the player have seen Alice in a very long time. Going through the screens takes Alan back to the writer's room, only to find a dead body of himself in the chair, which ends the episode, and finally puts an end to this damn prologue. Apologies if that summary was a bit longer than expected, I probably could have ended this prologue section and started rambling a lot earlier, but it felt better to stop it here due to what happens after, as now the player is able to play Saga and Alan's story at any time in any order they wish. That brief time with Alan did not end with him on the shore, which means there's more to the story, and in narrative order, thanks to the title of the book, initiation is the one that happens first. The player can do all of Alan's story first, then Saga's, do one chapter at a time or any other combination. This is a pain in the ass for the purposes of nailing down the story, but it's exceptional game design, as the player is given the freedom to play how they want. If Saga's section or gameplay is just not jiving with you at the moment, then you can switch back to Alan and vice versa. If the current story arc feels boring or sluggish, then you can just take a break and switch to another character, and you can do this in the middle of the missions too, as long as the save room has a black puddle inside it. That's why this prologue section is so long, because we now just got the chance to switch campaigns at will. Sam Lake, director of Remedy Entertainment, mentioned how one of his goals was to make longer games, as it's hard to make them longer using the kind of ideas he has. Well, I can confidently say that worked, as that whole prologue took about six and a half hours to get through, which, as a comparison, Alan Wake 1 without DLC took ten hours to complete. In any case, this, what I'll call a prologue, is great, as it teaches the player the mechanics of each character and how they'll go about the world in their campaigns. 
while also setting up the story and its dangling mysteries, and thanks to the game giving the player the choice of how they want to continue, the player is able to play the content that they're most interested in first. If seeing Alan's story was more intriguing to them, then they could start with that. But if Saga's was more intriguing to the player early on, then they could start with her side of the story first. It's probably the best handled dual protagonist system that I've ever seen. The Last of Us Part II also had two protagonists in the form of Ellie and Abby, but many players were annoyed by the amount of content they had to do as Abby, not just because of what she meant to the story, but because her entire campaign came right after Ellie's, so the player had to go through the same three days in Seattle but as someone else. The story also left off on a cliffhanger, one that wouldn't be seen until after the player goes through Abby's side of the story, which was at least 12 hours long. Part of me wonders how this game would have been received had Naughty Dog opted to take Remedy's approach to it instead. Now to be fair to Naughty Dog, the Last of Us and Alan Wake deal with very different subject matter and stories, so it's possible that it would have never worked to begin with. But Alan Wake 2 really opened my eyes to this style of storytelling, as giving the player the option to switch off at any time might have lessened the boredom that many players experience while playing The Last of Us Part 2. Remedy has always been one to change things by going bigger, better, and usually weirder, and I think the way they created this dual protagonist system is a testament to their creativity, as I've never seen something like this handled before this well. As I said before though, Alan's story happens first due to initiation being the second book in the story, so while my initial playthrough was filled with constant back and forth switching, I'm going to organize it one campaign at a time to make things easier to digest. This means we're going to be talking about Alan's first, but I want to briefly talk about the gameplay just in case you're someone who hasn't played the game yet. Fortunately, most of the game is just like the last, such as using light to defeat the shadows then peppering them with bullets. The difference is that the movement and combat in general feels very similar to the more recent Resident Evil remakes. I wanted to point that out specifically because quite a few of you in the previous video mentioned how the gameplay was stopping you from enjoying the story. So if you're one of those people, you might want to consider playing the second game to see how it feels. I think my only gripe is that the flashlight isn't a continuous hold anymore, but more of an action. Meaning one press removes a set amount of flashlight battery, and while that's fine, if you aren't perfect with its placement, you'll only be able to remove some of the shadow, forcing you to use another part of the battery for such a small amount of shadow. As an isolated incident, it wouldn't be too much of a problem, but Alan Wake 2 makes everything finite, meaning health and batteries don't recharge anymore, so you have to play frugally and carefully. Outside of that though, the gameplay does what it needs to, and while I prefer the previous game's flashlight mechanics, I can understand that it was most likely added to elevate the survival horror experience. With that done though, let's get back to the story. Where we last left off, Alan just found his own body in the writer's room before being overtaken by some kind of presence. The next chapter picks up back in the writer's room again. The dark presence was able to stop Alan, and now he has to escape again. Alan Wake is once again stuck in a time loop, however it's different. A message this game hammers home quite a bit is that it's not a loop, but a spiral. A loop implies that the same events are happening every single time without change, but a spiral is a slight change over time that will eventually lead to a new end. American Nightmare was a loop, Alan Wake 2 is a spiral. He might be going through the same locations and doing the same things, but how and where he finds these murder sites, and what he experiences changes each time, bringing him closer and closer to an escape. Helping him keep track of this is his writer's room. Saga has her own room called the Mind Place, but it's structured a bit differently due to their lines of work. Story-wise, Alan's board is used as a way to collect the thoughts of his ever-changing mind, as he seems to lose his memories quite frequently, as well as plan out the steps of the current draft he's working on for the story. Alan can also use the board to change the scenes he's in, allowing him entry to other parts of the dark place. That tunnel that was previously blocked in the prologue was unlocked by taking the setting and changing the scene. Alan needs to write his way out, so things he can come across can be used as inspiration to write the story. It's a nice mechanic that is both a gameplay and story device that makes the two blend more seamlessly together. As a concept, I really like the spiral idea as well as the writer's room, and I'm really glad American Nightmare was used as the jumping off point for it, as it introduced both the idea of loops into Alan Wake as well as the scene setting idea. Like I said in that previous video, a bad game doesn't mean it had bad ideas. It takes a lot of intelligence to admit that something you had might have been great but was just in the wrong place. An American Nightmare was full of great concepts just waiting to be used in something with more time and budget, and I'm really glad that Remedy was able to finally make that happen with Alan Wake 2. Speaking of which, Remedy also seems to have taken a few pages from Control, as these hard-to-see memory things are reminiscent of the brief scenes we see in Control that are a part of the hotline, and it also carries over the full-screen title card for each chapter. It really seems like Control was where Remedy found its style, which makes sense given it was the first game in years that they were able to make without outside interference, as Quantum Break and even Alan Wake 1 to an extent are published by Microsoft, but Control was their first independent game in a long time and it's been fascinating to see in real time how the dev team has grown and found their style. Sometimes though, that style makes them get a little bit carried away, such as what occurs in the following scene, 
as Alan Wake is once again backstage, but instead of sitting down and answering questions, the whole crew performs a musical. I feel like Remedy sat down and said, You remember the ashtray maze from Control? We should keep that same tone but add elements of the Dynamite song with Dr. Darling, because that's exactly what this is. It's a long fight with our own background music once again performed by the old gods of Asgard. They also never seem to let things go to waste. If they add something to the game, it's going to have time in the script, as this is a whole 14 minute long section. What's annoying is that I hate that they were right about this though, because I love the ashtray maze and I love this scene here too for equally the same reasons. And I thought this place couldn't get any stranger. Yeah, you and me both. Just like last time, exiting the building has Alan getting a call from Thomas Zane. Alan seems to remember the call from last time, which surprises Tom as this is a first, further proving that Alan is moving in a spiral, not a loop. The rest of the chapter is going to be the same though, as we have yet another murder site to find. The murder this time around involves a play. At the hotel was a play about a murder cult, played by an actual murder cult, which is very meta. The reason this play was performed here at this hotel was because it was said to be haunted, as a real cult performed sacrifices here in the building. Where things start to get concerning is that the devil is supposed to be a part of the play, but the person who played the devil was some big time celebrity who was always in character even before the play started. The cast was actually concerned that they had hired the devil to play himself. Where the murder comes in is that the person playing the devil knew the woman who was playing the muse in the play, and used the play as a way to murder her. Cold Case Casey is now once again on the case and believes that this devil character is Mr. Scratch, linking it to his connection with the cult. To get there, Alan is going to have to take a trip to this fictional New York he's crafted up, and I gotta say, this game is gorgeous. The brightly lit signs crowding the sky and the piled up cars really make this place feel abandoned. The Taken that litter the street also adds to the horror elements, as something unique to Alan's campaign is that the Taken don't always want to kill him. I still haven't quite figured out how the mechanic works myself, but some of the Taken just disappear if you get too close. As an element of the game design, it means that getting too close might get you killed, but passively shooting at anything in your way means you'll be wasting ammo on enemies that weren't trying to kill you. It's a really unique take on the survival horror genre, and their constant comments about Alan really make the hairs on your neck stand up. Alan will then eventually arrive at the hotel to see what's going on and hopefully gain some inspiration, which I find to be hilarious. As Alan hears these horrific tales like, yeah, an entire train of people just burned to death, or a cult murdered a whole hotel, and Alan goes, wow, this is going to be amazing material for the script, as if that's not like the most horrific thing to ever grace his ears. Now it is explained that the story needs to get more and more gruesome so it can amplify the writing and hopefully make it easier to escape, but it's always odd to remember that Alan's writings can rewrite reality, meaning the fates of everyone from the first game were because of him. It really puts into perspective the amount of power he has and how dangerous this device can be as one wrong step and it's over. Stopping some of that inspiration is a film reel that sends him into the room with the Thomas Zane. This is the first time we've seen Thomas's face before, and while it could be another trick like in Control, a newspaper of him and Barbara confirms that this is the real Thomas Zane. This explains why Ati and the Anderson brothers keep calling him Tom, as they look the same. However, it's never explained why. Similar to Control, the conversation just doesn't feel quite right. Not only does Zane not bring up his poetry in insisting that he's a filmmaker, but he also talks about Alan and him collaborating on a project that he doesn't remember. Zane claims that Alan was going to write Return while he crafted a film that together would be enough to get them both out of the dark place. But Alan doesn't remember writing Return. Just like last time, Alan is going to have to find certain scenes and use those to change the story. I know we already talked about this before, but I seriously cannot get over how technically impressive this whole thing is. Changing the scene is seamless and takes less than a couple seconds. And yet not only did I rarely run into any hitches when changing scenes, but Remedy took the time to actually design each location around the theme. The scene doesn't change the whole area, only a few specific sections, but they still took the time to design each one around the inspirations. More often than not, the scenes and settings you find are progressive, so scenes you use in the beginning won't be used in the final piece, as you usually use one scene to gather another, only to use that one to find the next. And yet even though most players may not see all of the different looks across the areas, they still made them anyway, and it's the most impressive part of the game. The environmental storytelling Remedy uses throughout these scene changes is also top notch as well, but that was never something I was worried about. Seeing how they handled the oldest house and all of its complex and varied shapes and sizes, I knew Remedy was going to nail their new setting without any effort and they didn't disappoint. Both campaigns have such gorgeous locations that are distinct enough to immediately tell where you are just in case you're lost, and they also brought back their old idea from Control where they littered the area with directional signs, allowing navigation to be easier and not require the use of the map. After you play enough games from a specific developer, certain things tend to be customary or expected. And when it comes to Remedy, I never need to worry about the actual settings themselves as they've never let me down once. 
After exploring long enough, Alan will eventually make it to room 108, where the body was dumped after the devil had killed her. This once again leads to another talk with Saga and the appearance of the Parliament Tower. This time, Alan is able to find more recordings of Alice who talks about the exhibit. Like before, Alan then finds himself in the writer's room except it's empty. He also finds the manuscript pages for Return, which Alan claims was written by scratch as this wasn't something he would ever write. He then starts adding pages to it in an attempt to edit the script, only for Scratch to come in and shoot him, so now he's gone from arriving too late to the murder scene to being the murder victim. Another failure, but another attempt, slowly but surely creating that spiral. Third time's the charm as they say, so let's do it again. We go through another late night show interview, but this time Mr. Dor drops the act and tells him he's only going along with the charade to indulge him. He only exists because someone Mr. Dor cares about was thrown into the story because of Alan and he wants to get them out, which is... Shockingly honest, and also really terrifying. It's also not the only time someone calls him out for this, as Saga's going through the same thing and will berate Alan for the same reason a bit later. Unfortunately, we don't get to hear too much about Mr. Dor after this conversation, so we never find out who this person is and why they're uniquely tied to Tim Breaker. Ati also returns to tell us about the basement and how there's photos that we need to collect. These photos are of a clicker and a bullet. These aren't going to be helpful now, but they will soon, as they're what we need to complete the ending to this story. Just like last time we meet with Thomas, but the conversation is less pleasing. Thomas confessed to working with Scratch to find a way out, because Alan had given up a long time ago, saying that it wasn't worth it anymore and that he doesn't deserve to get out. But Scratch was determined to leave, so him and Thomas worked together instead. He then apologizes before attempting to what I assume is him taking over control of the scene again, but Alan is able to fight back and shoot him. Thomas isn't dead though as he appears again after the film has been played out as a sort of after credit cutscene showing that this was all an act. As for our final murder site, this one is at the cinema, the same one Tom Zane was playing his new film at called Nightless Night. There is an urban legend around the film claiming that it's a snuff film and that there was an actual murder during the production. What's even weirder is that the film as well as the echoes start to get a bit meta. The film itself not only stars Alex Casey, but after confronting the Grand Master, he thanks Casey for playing the role of the fictional detective to get the writer here, before greeting Alan Wake. It should be mentioned that these echoes are real things that have happened. Alan originally thought that these were ideas, likely from his past drafts as he's losing his memories constantly. But there is one later in the game with Saga, and after the two talk, it becomes clear that these things are real events. How something from the past is able to be sent forward in time to the present is not understood, but it's not the only time this has happened. Later in Saga's campaign, she's going to need to perform a concert to get Alan out of the dark place. But while she succeeds in doing so, Alan isn't sent into the present day, but back in time when we first met him on the shore. As another example, Saga needed to find Nightingale's heart in order to activate this overlap. But when arriving at the crime scene, she discovered that it was moved to a nearby freezer. From Alan's side though, he was able to find the heart at the murder site, but it disappeared before he could touch it, almost as if he moved it back in time for Saga to find. It gives off the impression that there is a set timeline to things, but that future events can influence the past, so that those future events can happen. This same idea could be applied to the Echoes, as the Grandmaster is talking to Casey and Alan Wake, even though Alan is viewing this later in time. All of this culminates in Alan finally making it to the murder site. The mask in this scene was the key, and just like the heart, Alan gets near it only for it to disappear. This mask is used for the parade float later, further confirming that Alan is helping Saga by sending her specific items. For the final time though, we get another overlap conversation before the appearance of the Parliament Tower. Before you leave though, you can watch a clip of that film Tom Zane was making, and it's a full-on 15-minute short film. The film itself is rather fascinating given what transpires. The plot seems to be about Alex Casey falling in love with a woman called Barbara Jagger. She then drugs him only for the cult of the word to appear and kill him. His death seems to have released Tom Zane from the well, allowing him to be free and reunited with his wife. It's important to remember that this film was supposed to be used in tandem with Return, so Thomas Zane could escape. A quote that's repeated in here is, The ritual to lead you on. He returns, and you in turn are locked in the room. Within the film, this means that Thomas Zane returns and Alex Casey is caught in a loop, but it feels more important than that. Unlike Casey who plays himself, Thomas actually plays Alan Wake. I can't help but feel that this film was an attempt at sabotaging either Alan or both Casey and Alan. Early on in Alan's campaign, Casey is killed by the Dark Presence, when Alan finds his stuff, he says that the writer has assumed the role of the detective. While this is a bit tongue-in-cheek on the surface, it could also refer to Alan taking Casey's place. He has presumably done everything Casey did when investigating the cult, so this film is likely talking about Alan being left behind. To further reinforce this, not only is the writer's room in the film, but the final line is, it's not a loop, it's a spiral, which is what Alan will say at the end of the game. Ignoring the fact that Remedy literally made an entire short film and placed it right in the middle of the game for the player to enjoy, the story itself is rather interesting, as there's so many layers to it, to where a surface level examination would be missing out on all the small details. 
Following the premiere of the weirdest film I've ever seen, Alan receives a call from himself telling him to put the photos Alice took in a shoebox. This Alan he is talking to is from the future, or more specifically a different place in the timeline. Just like our talk about Saga finding Alan on the shore, it's once again a future Alan talking to past Alan to make sure the events go in the way they ought to. Once again confirming that all of this is a single timeline that goes back and forth depending on certain actions. Placing these items though takes us back to Saga, as we aren't allowed to continue without progressing her story. While the middle portion of the story is up to the player, the beginning and the finale of the story needs to play in the order Remedy wants it to, so we need to make it to the end of Saga's story so that we can catch up on what's going on. Before we transfer over to her though, let's talk about Alan. For a game named after him, I'm surprised they went with two protagonists, and whether intentional or not, I actually like Saga's campaign more. Alan is most definitely a much better character on account of him already being in the prior games, but I really enjoyed Saga's campaign more. Alan's story might be one of the most confusing things I've ever played, and even after mulling over all the details, I still feel like I don't have a grasp on this at all. There are so many unanswered questions that I'd hoped this game would answer, except it answered none and only added more. But at this point, it's become a remedy staple. While most of these plot threads are left dangling, there is enough to theorize on what could happen, and the meta elements do make this campaign a genuinely enjoyable experience. Thematically, the constant headaches that would come from trying to piece together any of this story are in line with what Alan is trying to do when writing this book. Initiation can be best described as an organized, jumbled mess. It's messy, out of order, and very confusing, but it's all there. The breadcrumb trail is always present and will lead you somewhere. It might not be the route you wanted, and the crumbs might go in a different direction, get you turned around, and go back, but it is going somewhere, and I feel like that's an allegory for a lot of Remedy's recent works. It's going to take a lot of time to get there, and you will without question get lost along the way, but you are going somewhere. It's fitting that the middle book in the trilogy is the most confusing of the three, as it's the middle part of Remedy's games where the story starts to feel like an ever-shifting maze. Alan Wake 1 was confusing, yes, but made sense as things started to unfold. And Saga's campaign is a lot less puzzling, but Alan's is that awkward middle. From the original Alan Wake 2 Control, Remedy's recent games start with a stellar and intriguing opening, to a confusing and complicated middle, that then ends with a cliffhanger ending that ties things up but still leaves them open for a sequel. And I feel like Remedy took that but expanded it over the course of the three campaigns within this series. Alan's campaign is stressful and utterly confusing to piece together, but I feel like that's the fun of it. The first line of Alan Wake 1 is a quote from Stephen King talking about the beauty of horror is the unexplained, and that there is little horror to be had in explanations. If the main antagonist explained its entire motivation then the mystery is gone. In that same vein, the Dark Presence being this formless entity with unclear goals outside of wanting to take over the world is what adds to the mystique. Community discussion is one of my favorite parts of playing games, and is why I make some of these videos in the first place, to act as a sort of hub for people to pull their ideas into. Some games are never going to be solved alone, but enough community discussion and theory will eventually lead to an answer, and it's something that Alan Wake does in spades. Initiation while confusing mess is a nice mess, one that I thoroughly enjoyed. Unfortunately, I also like getting answers to my questions, which Alan's campaign rarely does, but thankfully Saga's campaign is no stranger to. Saga's campaign might not give us answers to things in initiation, but at least it's not going to leave you scratching your head every 15 minutes wondering what the hell is going on. When we last left off, Saga had come to Bright Falls to investigate a series of ritualistic murders. During that time, she discovered supernatural forces were at play and that Alan Wake, a writer that she had heard had gone missing 13 years ago, had just washed up on the shore next to her. Saga and her partner Alex Casey then decided to take him back to the lodge. The dynamic between Casey and Saga is a pleasant one, and also inspired by the crime series True Detective. True Detective is a crime anthology, meaning that each season has a new set of characters and stories. But many people, including Remedy it seems, really enjoy the first season. The plot is about two detectives, Rust and Cole, played by Matthew McConaughey, and Martin Hart, played by Woody Harrelson, who came to Louisiana to investigate a murder that turns into a deeper investigation into a cult. The two characters also seem to be loosely connected to our buddy cop duo as well. Rust and Cole had a daughter named Sophia who was tragically killed in a car accident. And while Saga's daughter Logan is still alive and well, she finds out very quickly that Return is changing the story of her family, which includes her and her husband divorcing and Logan drowning to death. And Martin is more or less connected to Alex Casey by way of the two constantly talking about their ex-wives. Using something this deliberate isn't really anything new for Remedy, as Stephen King was practically the face of the first game, so it's no wonder they're continuing that trend here. That said, the duo worked quite well together and was a highlight of Saga's campaign. Hearing the two bounce ideas off each other while also seeing how well their personalities blend together made their conversations a joy to listen to. What also added to the joy of the campaign was Saga's version of the writer's room. The mind place, like Alan's, is a way for her to keep track of all the info she learns during the case, and I never felt more like a detective than when I was in this room. 
The whole thing is separated into case files that have layers upon layers of info to comb over all connected through post-it notes and strings. It's also carefully organized and comes with small blurbs from Saga so you know exactly what's going on. Alan had something like this too in his room in the form of small notes on his board, but given what actually happens during that story, a lot of it isn't too helpful. The first part of the case board is about Alan and the cult, and after a brief discussion with Alan, Saga is able to then use him as a profile. Along with the case board, the profiling table is used to gather more information. What's bizarre about its implementation is that Saga is able to sense things that are never brought up. Despite never mentioning this in their original conversation, Saga is able to know that Alan is hiding manuscript pages on him. Originally, I was baffled as to how this was even possible and thought this was just a gameplay gimmick to progress the story, but there is a real reason why she can do this, even if the explanation is just as bizarre as the concept itself. Saga, due to her being an Anderson, has powers, so to speak, that allow her to see through the lies and discover the real truth. Meaning everything that occurs in these profiles actually happened and is our one source of true information. Where this talk takes her is the nearby town of Watery, as Saga's trying to find the clicker that Alan lost. The town itself is filled with many lively people all going about their day and enjoying their life. I've read that taking a sauna is good for preventing dementia. Yeah, and so is beer. However, many of the people here start to talk to Saga as if they know her. As we talked about before in Alan's section, the book Return that Scratch wrote is changing the story, and the line between fact and fiction is becoming very blurry. According to some of the residents, Saga used to live here with her daughter, and when she mentions how that's not possible and that her daughter is back home, they try to console her saying things like, hey, it's, it's alright, I understand that was a very hard time for you. Return wrote that Saga and her husband divorced, causing Saga to take their child Logan to Watery where they lived in a trailer park. But one day Logan drowned in the lake when Saga wasn't looking. It's very conflicting for her because nothing is making sense and because she's an Anderson and can see through the story, she starts questioning whether or not she's gone crazy as everyone is in agreement about what happened except for her. It's a welcome change to the story so far, as we've played as Alan Wake, the mastermind behind the stories, but now we're playing as one of those people affected by the story. It's like playing the first game as Nightingale, an FBI agent trying to arrest someone who's then taken by a shadowy presence. A lot of that was out of his control thanks to Alan pulling the strings, and that kind of makes him come off as an asshole. He does feel bad about what he's done and will mention it repeatedly to Saga, but it's also really terrifying to think of all the people that he's affected just to get out. In a way though, it does make sense, and Remini really nailed this aspect of Alan, as the longer he stays in the dark place, the more numb he becomes. Alan's desperate, and doesn't really care what happens as long as he gets out, and I really enjoy this change for his character. He's still the same person that we know and love, but now that we're seeing things from another side, it starts to put things into perspective. Saga's current objective is to find the trailer park, but to get there she needs a key, but the key is locked behind a door at the amusement park coffee world. A lot of this game's objectives are like this, where it's a roadblock blocked by a roadblock, but to get past that roadblock we need to get past the prior one. Surprisingly though, I actually didn't mind it, as once again if the story is boring you could just switch to Alan for a quick change of pace, but I never did that myself as the exploration and combat helped to carry the rest of the way. Alan Wake 2 being more of a horror game also made walking around areas intense, as the creak of a branch or a loud noise would immediately gather my attention. Like I said, there was never a time I felt bored while playing, and while some of the objectives might have taken a while to get through, I never found myself fatigued by the content, so massive props to Remedy for nailing the pacing of this middle section. At the trailer park is the Anderson brothers who are getting drunk off their moonshine again. They also greet Saga as it's been a while since they've seen her. At the time, Saga finds them to be just as confused as everyone else, but she does learn later that she is in fact related to the brothers. On that note, I love the intentional naming behind Saga. Odin and Thor are obviously based on Odin and Thor from Norse mythology, in fact their names correlate to their battle with the Dark Presence as Odin, like the god, had his eye cut by the Dark Presence, but there's a funny line in a manuscript where Odin is pissed because he cut the wrong eye. Eventually, Thor ended up having a child named Freya, who is Saga's mom. Saga is the only one of the family not named after a god, but the word Saga is another name for a story or tale, and Saga is here to change that story, so her being called Saga was completely intentional and a nice touch. Nearby the trailer is an ominous figure who is stalking her. This turns out to be Mulligan, one of the deputy duo we saw in the intro, and the same ones who are dead in Alan's campaign. They seem to be allied with the cult, meaning that they were watching us investigate a murder that they committed. However, a manuscript page explains that they accidentally killed an innocent girl. This is something we'll learn from Ilmo later, but the cult of the tree are not the bad guys. Far from it, actually. The cult that we saw kill Nightingale are a sort of neighborhood watch for the town. They know of the dark place, the lake, and the Taken, so they protect the town from those that wash up on shore. That's why they hunted Nightingale, as that's where he came from. The ritual stuff is reminiscent of what Alan did to the Dark Presence. He took the clicker and put it in Barbara's chest to defeat her. So the cult is doing that with the victims who become Taken. The reason it didn't work for Nightingale is because they were interrupted. Those two teens that were trespassing and happened to catch them interrupted the ritual, so in theory had they succeeded, Nightingale wouldn't have come back alive and actually would have died. 
Thornton and Mulligan are a part of that group, but were out hunting one day for Taken and mistook one for an innocent girl named Monica. This creates a rather interesting connection to Alan's side of the story, as the two cops killed an innocent girl and then dumped her body in the well hoping no one would find out. But in Alan's story, two cops are trying to rise through the ranks using this nearby shoot to dump bodies killed by the cult of the word into the well. Alan's story is like a perverted, twisted version of what happened in the real world, and due to him having some kind of clairvoyance, he is well aware of these events that are happening. This is also why the well creates an overlap, as the killing of that girl is a part of the town's dark past. So Alan used that and created a story within the dark place, spawning the overlap. Going inside has Saga fighting the two at the same time, which is quite intense. Defeating them grants her the clicker, as well as a conversation with Alan just like the others. While Saga returns to brief the group, we see a quick scene from Bright Falls, where the cult raid the lodge where Alan and Casey are staying. That's a little strange, given I just mentioned they only hunt Taken. But according to them, anything that comes out of that lake is evil, especially Alan Wake, as he was the cause of the events back in the first game. Casey attempts to fight them off, but Alan starts to send Scratch before blacking out. I gotta say, these brief moments of Casey really makes me hope that he gets his own little DLC, as everything out of his mouth is just pure gold due to his line delivery. FBI! We want the rider! No one else needs to get hurt! Fuck off! Alan manages to wake up after the destruction has been dealt and ends up running throughout the woods to find Casey. Alan manages to catch up, but is then taken down by a cult member, only for Saga to save him just in time, only for the FBC to come strolling in and take a hold of the operation. The cult member's mask comes off and is revealed to be Ilmo, the man from earlier. He and his brother Yako are the leaders of the cult. The leader of this specific task force, though, is Agent Estevez, which is a nice callback to Control, as Langston mentioned that she was the lead agent at Bright Falls, so it's nice to put a face to the name. Just like all the FBC, though, she is completely desensitized to all this and is all business. That was always one of my favorite parts about Control, how all the employees could see someone splattered across the wall but consider it a normal Tuesday thanks to their profession, and it's good to see them keep that same personality with Estevez. But Saga is now left with no leads thanks to the FBC taking the operation, and no partner as Casey is missing. Fortunately, the Anderson brothers give her a call and ask her to come back to the nursing home. This place is called the Valhalla Nursing Home, because of course it is. It is when she discovers her powers as an Anderson, as Odin is able to take control of the profiling booth, which is something that she's never experienced before. While on the call with the brothers though, Tor was heard being attacked, which is when we see him being dragged into the lake by Cynthia Weaver, the lamp lady from the first game. Watching over all the elderly is also Rose the waitress from the diner. The dark presence still seems to have an effect on her mind, but she's definitely doing much better than she was before. Rose will then explain that Tor has become obsessed with Cynthia recently and has been flirting with her. It feels like she's casted a spell on him, as he's been obeying everything she says. However, she is most definitely an ally of the Dark Presence now, so it's probably the Dark Presence trying to finally kill the brothers. How this happened is actually quite sad. Cindy had always been fighting the Dark Presence, but after years and years she started to become old and frail. She had tried to continue placing stashes and setting up lights, but it became too much for her. One day she was sitting in the bathroom clutching a lamp before it went out, followed by a voice speaking to her from the darkness. Cynthia then tried to stand up, but slipped and fell into the tub, where the Dark Presence managed to finally take her over. This lines up perfectly with how we find her in Alan's campaign. To get them though, we're going to need to open the overlap, which is done by playing a record in the jukebox. Turning that on is going to require us to get the power on as Cynthia turned it off. Which is when I discovered how much of an epic gamer I am, because I discovered a speedrun skip that allows me to clip through the ceiling, as apparently the containers have collisions, so moving forward while it opens shoots you above it. Incredible. This is also around the time I realized just how terrifying this game can be. I'm not sure why this place of all places was the one to do it, but I think it was the flashing faces of Cynthia coupled with the complete silence of these areas. While Alan Wake 2 wasn't as scary as something like Alien Isolation or Resident Evil 7, which I consider to be some of the scariest survival horror games I've ever played, the dark forests are dense enough to hide anything standing next to them, and more often than not, the Taken are hiding in these exact places and most of the locations feel equally abandoned yet lived in, like it's intentionally abandoned so the residents can ambush those who enter. I felt that mostly in Saga's campaign, and it's a solid change between the two, as most of the enemies in Alan's campaign are front and center, but figuring out who's going to attack you or not is where the horror comes in. With Saga, you're allowed to shoot anything that moves, but that's assuming you can find them before they find you. Defeating Cynthia relinquishes the Dark Presence control over her and rescues Tor. We get another conversation but from Saga's side again, which ends with her being mad at Alan for writing her daughter into the story without her consent. To get some answers from Alan, Saga decides to go back to the sheriff's station, which is where the FBC is holed up. Down here is also Alex Casey who managed to find his way back to town, but from an injury report and a profiling case, we learn that Casey is a lot more injured than he implies, as he seems to have been exposed to the darkness from the dark place. A small hint of darkness though is going to be the least of everyone's worries, as Alan is down here in the cells, but Alan was not Alan, but Mr. Scratch. 
Sort of. How this happened is shown at the end of Alan's campaign, past the part we were stuck on. But basically, Alan was infected by the Dark Presence right before he was taken out, turning Alan into Scratch. In that ending, a Dark Void comes to consume Alan. It's best to think of that Void as Scratch. That's why when we eventually defeat Scratch, Alan is still okay and back to his normal self. This creates a very concerning revelation that is about to be revealed in just a moment, but that's something we'll have to discuss in the next section, as this is past the point of no return. So for now, let's wrap up our talk with Saga. As I mentioned in the prior section, I actually enjoyed Saga's campaign more, which is surprising given the stories about Alan Wake. That's not to say Alan's section was bad, as I've already discussed at length why it's just as good, but Saga's was great for its own reasons. Whereas Alan's was great because of the mysteries, Saga's was great because we got answers to the mysteries. Not all of it to be fair, as most of Alan's campaign is left out of Saga's story, but the question surrounding the cult and their motives was explained in grave detail. It does go against that quote of Stephen King's about leaving questions unanswered, but most of this stuff is not integral to the overall plot. The cult are important, but it's definitely something that should be answered and not left in the dark, as we have more important things to focus on like Mr. Scratch. His role in all this is also not only fascinating on its own, but it's further amplified by the dual protagonist system. Sokka is under the impression that Alan wrote Return, and thus made her daughter a part of the story, and if you continue with her story, then you go on believing that. But going through Alan's story first means we already know who wrote it and that Saga is wrong. I think that's why there's no wrong way to play the game, as the content that needs to be answered will be, but how you experience it is up to you. It creates your own personal experience, as for me, I wasn't phased at all by Saga's comment about her daughter because I knew it was going on. But someone who kept playing as Saga might start to see Alan as the bad guy when that's not true. It's an incredible thing to witness unfold, and being able to craft a unique experience in a survival horror game like this is downright impressive, as I've never seen it done before. Both Saga and Alan are fantastic characters, each in their own ways. And giving the player the time to experience their sides of the story removes the problem of spending too much time on one character while neglecting the other, as it's up to the player to decide how they want to proceed. As much as I like Saga though, I do like Alan Wake more. I also don't recall the series being titled Saga Anderson, so we should probably get back to the story and save Alan before we have to change the name. The finale starts from Saga's perspective, because Alan is, uh, currently busy at the moment. The plan is to call up the Anderson brothers and perform a concert. The music connected with the Dark Place and the clicker should be able to get Alan out of the Dark Place. So like Alan's campaign, we're going to have to fight a wave of Taken with our own musical theme in the background. Once finished, Saga activates the clicker, which sends Alan back to the real world, but like we talked about before, it didn't send him back to this time, but to the past when he arrives on the shore. How is that possible? Well, the game gives us control of Alan so we can find out ourselves. Parliament Tower is now open, and taking it up to the top shows the same things as before, Alice's art exhibit and the writer's room. But this time, what occurs is a lot more important. The last clip of Alice's exhibit talks about her fight with her mind. Alice is still seeing Scratch and can't wake up from this nightmare that she feels like she's in but it's the final scene that really sets the tone here. Alice says that the artist will now become the art, before some ominous text comes up that states that shortly after this recording, Alice took her own life. Alice is dead. She's been dead. This whole time we were trying to get Alan back to her, but she's been gone for years. The way the scene is presented is perfect. No music, no audio, just the sound of static as we slowly see Alice take her own life. It's horrifying and probably the scariest scene in the game. A perfect example of less is more. No jump cuts, bright flashes, or intense gore, just the raw emotions of a person at the end of their rope. It's terrifying but brilliantly presented. Upon hearing this, Alan goes into a rage, walks into the writer's room, and shoots Scratch. Or... did he? Alan has been both the victim and now the killer in this exact scene, so how can that be? Well, Scratch and Alan are one and the same. It wasn't Scratch who tortured Alice day in and day out, it was Alan. To put it simply, Alan is Alan, but Scratch is Alan with the Dark Presence inside of him. This whole time Alan thought the Dark Presence was hunting him, such as when Scratch appeared during the Lodge incident. But the Dark Presence was actually inside of him the whole time, as it was just regaining its strength back so it could finally take him over. That's why after fighting Scratch, who appears after our concert, Alan is able to be saved, but thanks to Casey being affected by the darkness, Scratch has found a new host. As for how Alan had no idea, well this is likely due in part to his memories fading. That collaboration he was going to make with Thomas Zane was likely a long time ago, but due to him losing his memories, he had forgotten that he wrote it. This, however, starts to get a little murky when we consider American Nightmare and even the ending of the first game, as they both exist independently from one another, so I'm honestly not sure what to make of this. My only explanation is that the Dark Presence was just assuming the form of Alan back then, but in here it was actually controlling and manipulating him. As a silver lining though, this is the first time in years Alan has had a clear head now that the Dark Presence is taking someone else over, so I can imagine that probably feels quite rejuvenating. 
Either way, the plan now is to go back to Bright Falls and enter that portal that Scratch created to hopefully fix all this damage. As not only has Casey been taken over by Scratch, but he also threw Saga into the lake so now she's in the dark place. The portal then takes him to another Bright Falls, but Returns version of it. Similar to the first game, Alan is going to have to change the ending of the book for this to work, but he's still in the confines of the story. And in another meta moment, one of the last moments of Return is Alan returning to Bright Falls during Deerfest, who is celebrating the release of the book Return. The townsfolk end up attacking him, so he attempts to get away by going back to the nursing home and opening the door with a spiral on it. While this happens, we get to see Saga's first stay in the dark place, which goes about as bad as Alan's first time in the dark place. The game continues to use the environment to convey this, but instead of us fighting the forces of dark or Alan's dark thoughts, we're now going to battle through Saga's mind with her mind place. The dark place erased all of her cases from the board, and none of the other stuff works either, like the upgrades of the profiling. I actually ran into this really weird bug where I was stuck in one of the menus, so now I and Saga were stuck in the dark place forever. Talk about immersive. Many of the notes now say very negative things, like how she's a bad mother or how she got Casey hurt. Similarly to Alan, she goes down a complete spiral, causing her to think worse and worse thoughts about herself, but eventually she's able to regain focus and be at peace. Where she ends up is the same place Alan was back in his campaign, except the person who calls her though isn't Thomas, but Alice. She tells her to go to the shoebox by the statue, which if you remember contains the photos of the clicker and the bullet that we put in there before we left Alan's campaign. Saga is going to use this to create the ending for the story. To make it stick, Alan needs to once again follow the criteria of an entertaining novel. It needs to fit with the horror genre of the book, flow well with the rest of the story, but also help him get the ending he wants. But unlike last time, he's not alone. Saga has become a vital part of the story, to the point where the two could be considered co-authors of Return, so the two are going to make up the story together. In a horror story though, there are only victims and monsters, and the hero will have to pay a heavy price. This price is death. Saga appears in the writer's room next to Alan. Right after, Scratch appears still holding over control of Casey. It then leaves its body and takes over Alan's, only for Saga to use the bullet from the photo on him. A bullet so bright it apparently hurts to look at, the perfect silver bullet for the darkness. Saga then pulls the trigger and shoots Alan, killing the Dark Presence and him in one shot. It then ends with Saga calling her daughter, hoping that she will pick up as that would mean that the story has changed, as she would no longer be dead as the story claimed. But we don't get to see that as the credits start rolling. This isn't the end of the story though, as after the credits we get a final message from Alice. She apologizes to us, as everything she made was meant to deceive us. Alice got in contact with the FBC a while ago, and was able to remember much of her time in the dark place before Alan changed the story in the first game. In here, she was able to notice that Alan was alive and not dead as she originally thought. Those hauntings of Scratch weren't terrifying her, as they were further confirmations that Alan was still out there. She knew that Alan was alive but stuck in the dark place, so she used her own form of art, photography, and tried to get him out. Those photos we used of the clicker and the bullet came from her. She was willing to put them in the dark place for us, and the reason she was talking with Saga is because she's in the dark place now. She came back to get Alan out. That's when the following scene showed that Alan lived, ending the game with the line, it's not a loop, it's a spiral. Alan is not going through the same events, as he's slowly creating a spiral, and this one had him being revived after being shot. This is the first time he's managed to live this encounter all game, so it's clear he's moved on to the next stage of the spiral. Long story short, Alan is alive, Alice is also alive, and both of them are stuck in the dark place, which brings an end to Alan Wake 2. Overall, it's a great conclusion that also sets up the next part of the story. If this game is anything like the first, then the DLCs will continue from here, and Remedy has confirmed that Alan Wake 2 will get two paid DLCs called Lake House and Night Springs. Lake House could deal with the actual plot, as Saga and Casey are still presumably in the dark place, along with Alan and Alice who are most definitely there. And Night Springs could possibly be about control, as Jesse and Dr. Darling do show up very briefly during our talk with Thomas, and on screen is the Night Springs logo. Alan Wake 2 also seems to be getting some free post-launch content, like a new game plus, as well as a nightmare mode, which seems to be like the previous game's nightmare mode, which gives out specific manuscripts only in that difficulty, so I'll be interested to see what the other pieces of lore are that are in these exclusive pages. Outside of that, that is all the information we have, but it's clear that Alan Wake 2, and by extension the Remedy Connected Universe, is just beginning. Remedy truly outdid themselves with Alan Wake 2. It's a culmination of all their successes and failures from their prior games, mixed with their unique sense of style that they've managed to develop throughout these games. It's hard to overstate just how impressive the dual protagonist system is, and how they managed to make both the gameplay and the story enjoyable, by allowing the player to craft their own story. The gameplay between the two characters is varied enough to feel different, bringing a sense of freshness to the combat at any given time, and the choose-your-own-adventure style of storytelling lets the audience dictate the pace. It's truly one of the finest horror games this year, and that's a hard club to get into given who's in attendance this year. Alan Wake 2 really stands with the best of them, and I hope that Remedy keeps this style of gameplay in mind for the next entry, if there is one. 
Although given the previous game, Remedy's probably going to change the gameplay of the DLC to test the waters to see how far they could push the game again. Who knows, we might get another action-style American Nightmare game where Alan uses ARs and full-auto shotguns again. But that's going to be it for me today. Alan Wake 1 has always been one of my favorite games of all time, and I'm glad that I was able to play and talk about the second one with you all today. Once again, if you need a quick refresher for the first game, you can watch my previous video, as well as my other story analysis videos if that interests you. Like the video if you enjoy, and subscribe if you're new. Thank you to my returning viewers for coming back to another video, and take care everyone. Goodbye.